In this episode, I want to talk about compromise antennas. What are they and what do they mean to your real world operating up next? Welcome to the House of Ham. I'm Bob WV7W and I want to take a few minutes to discuss a topic that may spark a fair bit of controversy. I'm sure I'll get a lot of comments that will disagree with what I'm about to say and that's okay. If you disagree with me, go ahead and voice your thoughts in the comments below. For the rest of you, I encourage you to read through those comments to get the alternative points of view. Now let's start off with what a compromise antenna is, or at least what most experienced hams would say they are, as much as this is open to interpretation. Now most would say that a compromise antenna is one that has less than unity gain, or in other words, some loss. And the best example of unity gain antenna and often our baseline is a resonant dipole up at least one half wavelength above the ground. Now, if a dipole is used as the reference, it will be listed in the specs as DBD, or decibels compared to a dipole. This is actually an important point as you will see differing references for antenna gain. A lot of times the specs will re reference DBI, but what is that? DBI is the amount of gain over an isotropic radiator, which is a single point in free space. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never actually seen an isotropic radiator, and most likely neither of you is it doesn't really exist as a theoretical entity. Practically speaking, worthless. And that is why I like the dipole reference better, as most hams have at least some experience with them and know what it means to be better or worse performance than that. If you want a really good explanation of DBI versus DBD, watch Callum's video on this subject, which I've linked in the description. Now, the other issue with these specs is how were they measured? Were they measured near field, far field? Maybe they weren't even measured at all and they just used some antenna modeling. The point here is take these specifications with a grain of salt. Now let's take a look at some antennas that are widely accepted to be compromised, such as short widths with a loading coil, like my new AX3 that I just did a video on. Now there's no way on God's green earth you're going to get the same effective radiated power out of this little antenna that you're going to get out of a full half-wave dipole. That being said, does that make this a bad antenna? Absolutely not. In fact, it is a really good antenna for what it's designed for. Now let's say you're on vacation, you're sitting on your balcony of your hotel or your condo. Can you string up a full-size dipole? Probably not. So you either use a compromised short antenna or not operate. What if you're out doing POTA or SOTA activation and either you don't have trees or something else to put a dipole up, or maybe the park doesn't allow for it? Now I have used 17-foot whips tuned as quarter-wave verticals and have gotten great results. Is it going to outperform a dipole? Most of the time, no. Although, depending on how high up you can get that dipole, you may get a better takeoff angle with the vertical, so your results may vary. And that is the crux of the discussion. You may have compromised effective radiated power for the space allowed. The 17-foot whip is a very quick to set up, and it has a really small footprint. And this leads me to what will really cause some of you to yell at the screen, but hear me out on what I'm about to say. All antennas are a compromise. Let me say that again. All antennas are a compromise. Even that high gain beam antenna 50 feet up on a tower with a rotator is a compromise. Now, obviously you're not compromising effective radiated power or front to back ratio. So from an RF performance perspective, there's no compromise at all. So what exactly is the compromise? Money, space, complexity are all things that are a compromise. Beams and all the associated support stuff tend to cost quite a bit of money as well as take a fair bit of work and know-how to get set up. A tower for your beam will likely require permits from your city or county, and some may not even allow it. Now for those that have beams, they are likely to say they're well worth it. And if you're a contester, the benefits will largely outweigh the downsides. Now with a beam, you're trading your cash and dealing with some complexity for something that will give you the very best possible antenna performance. 
Now let's go back to the other end of the spectrum. We often have to trade good performance for the ability to operate in restricted areas. Those in an HOA know exactly what I mean. You also need to understand that having a low gain or even somewhat lossy antenna will be impacted more by poor band conditions. But being someone that has done a bunch of QRP in the field with less than ideal antennas, I can attest that you can make QSOs. Now there are some tricks and tips to operating under these conditions, but that's a subject for another video. Now let's talk about complexity for a minute, particularly out in the field. There are some very high performance antennas such as the hex beam that will give you very good effective radiated output, but they're again more costly than the simpler antennas, not to mention the amount of time and effort they take to set up. Now I can get set up and complete a full park activation in the time that it will take someone to set up a hex beam. That being said, if you're doing something like field day, you'll be glad you took the time and have those extra dB and front to back ratio for those challenging contest conditions. Let me end this one by saying you need to understand your particular conditions for a given event. How much time do you have? What if any are the restrictions to your location you're at? What are the band conditions? How much power can you throw at? There is no such thing as a perfect antenna, just the best choice for you in your current situation. Know what you're up against and do what is best for you given the circumstances. And most importantly, get on the air and operate. When it comes right down to it, we do all of this stuff to make contacts. Hopefully you found this informative, if not thought provoking. I really do want to know what your thoughts are on the subject, so take a moment and leave me a comment below. Until next time, this is WV7W73.